this. Lab four. Parallel input, output, and control. So we're getting into the good stuff. So our objectives are to become familiar with optical encoding, uh, to implement a finite state machine control algorithm, to understand pulse modulation control of a DC motor, and to use instruction timing to produce a calibrated delay. So lots of good things in one lab. The introduction. In this exercise, your program will control and monitor the speed of a DC motor. Um, I will get, put a little caveat on that. We're not doing full closed loop feedback control. Um, but we are going to be monitoring what the speed is and changing that speed, but in a... Uh, uh, very simplistic way. So um, we're not closing the loop and trying to optimize how the output velocity is a certain commanded velocity. We're just saying put in this much voltage and measure what the speed is. <laughs> that's, that's what we're doing. So I mean, it's cool. It's just not like full closed loop control, which we will do, but we're just not there yet. One thing at a time, guys. The, the, the closed loop mean that you after the system is still operating, you can just adjust it through the input? Closed loop means that when we measure it, we're not just interested to see what the speed is. Mm -hmm. uh, we are measuring the speed and then trying to change our input to the system to make the speed what we want. Mm -hmm. um, what we're doing in this one is we're just setting like the voltage to like 10 volts. And then it's the system is going off and doing it. And then we're measuring what the speed is but we're not doing we're not changing our input mm -hmm. we're just measuring what the speed is and displaying it when we push a button mm -hmm. um, which is cool but it's not uh, if you wanted it to go at 500 rpm this wouldn't be the way to go <laughs> or if you wanted it to change from 500 rpm to 300 rpm yes. uh, with some certain uh, path that it took from one to the other mm -hmm this wouldn't be the way to go. Um, this is okay for like really simple, if you're like, okay, if I put in 10 volts, I get about this speed, so in steady state. So I will put in 10 volts and get that speed out. And like, maybe that's all you need. Um, in a lot of applications, you're, if you're gonna have the optical encoder to measure, you might as well um, close the loop. So we'll talk about closing the loop and what it means for performance and stuff. You can make that speed behave approximately the way you want it to behave um, for reasonable expectations of what you want. Um, uh, and not just like say this voltage corresponds approximately to this speed. You can, you can do better um, than that. So, yeah, but for this lab, it's so-called open loop control. We're just saying, here's the input, what's the output? Um, we're, we're actually measuring the output, but we're not using that in our control algorithm. Okay, uh, the interface between the MyRio and the motor will be a, uh, uh, several DIO, digital input output channels, and an FPGA encoder counter. See figure B three. So that is down here. Um, this is my real connector A. Channel zero is going to be the one that we're going to use to turn the motor, the power to the motor, on or off. Um, it's a digital channel, so it can really only be on or off. Uh, and we'll talk about how we can get variable on um, through that scheme. Uh, this is one uh, difference that we have from the, the UW group, and that is the, the current source amplifier for us is not a current source amplifier. It's instead a uh, motor driver uh, circuit, which we'll describe in more detail. I, I'm planning on describing it in detail next week to you guys. Uh, it's pretty cool, but I, 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 want to, to, I don't want to sell it short. So 
you can you can use the same control scheme for it that they're using for the current source amplifier. Uh, we might just need to invert the logic, but I haven't figured out that that part quite yet. But uh, we'll we'll talk more about it. The the, the idea though is that you flip this bit, um, this channel zero bit, rapidly, and it allows us to do PWM control of the motor speed. So we'll we'll uh, uh, we'll talk more about that. There's also this motor on the back of it, there's an encoder that interfaces with the uh, MyRio through the, an interface counter. So we will be measuring the shaft position via an encoder, and I'll talk a little bit about how encoders work. Um, and we're also going to have two buttons, um, switches that are spring-loaded so that when you're not pressing them, they're not connected, right? So we'll have two switches as well. Um, and these are the main sort of components of this, of this lab. We'll also have a, a, a keypad uh, uh, interface that we'll use, and we'll also use the LCD. So we're going to use all of them, the LCD, the keypad, the motor, the encoder, the motor driver. It's all here. It's all here in one lab. Just got it all. So... Yeah, um, very good. So the first thing that we'll talk about is PWM. So pulse width modulation. Channel zero of connector A, the digital signal on which we call run with a bar over it, which is to say we, we, we uh, uh, are using this notation says that the line over a name denotes a logical not, okay? So what we would call this, this signal on this channel, we would call it not run, okay? And it's really common to have this happen where you want to name it run, but the logic's inverted so that, so that uh, when this channel is at zero, you're running the motor, and when this channel is on one, you're not running the motor. So we call it not run, just to denote the fact that the, that the logic is inverted from what we mean when we say run. <laughs> um, it confuses everyone to no end. And I don't know. There's just no good way to go about it, I guess. So we're we're just gonna try, do our best, and I will mess up constantly. So uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll keep it straight. Um, so this this uh, not run signal um, connects channel zero to a motor driver circuit, uh, such that when not run is one, also called high. Uh, uh, for a digital signal, uh, no voltage is applied to the motor, and when not run is low, is zero, then 20 volts is applied to the motor. Okay, so. Just two conditions, one and zero, and, and this voltage. Exactly. So, if, it, it, but it's unfortunately backwards from run, so it's not run, right? Uh, yeah, so your program will periodically alter this digital signal applying an oscillating signal to the motor. The duty, <coughs> excuse me, the duty cycle, which is the d percentage of time power is applied, uh, is the percentage of the time the channel is low. So we'll talk more about PWM, but the basic idea is that uh, if you switch it on and off really fast at a really high frequency, um, then the motor sees essentially an average of the signal that you're applying. Um, so if you can imagine that it looks like this, for instance. And remember, our logic is inverted, so during this portion, 
we would be run, and then this portion we would be not run. <laughs> um, if if we adjust the width of these, so it just keeps repeating over and over again. If we adjust the width so that uh, it's in the run state for more of the period, then the average of the signal increases uh, all the way up to being full bore on all the time, which would be a 100% duty cycle. So it would always be in the run state, always in low. 0% duty cycle would be down to having it never be in run state, always in not run. And uh, so you can vary it in between, and it essentially varies. The average of the signal varies linearly with the, uh, uh, the duty cycle. So 50% duty cycle, half on, half off, would give you half of the average. So if your full bore is 20 volts, and you did it 50% duty cycle, you get 10 volts. If you were on 75% uh, duty cycle, with 20 volts being full bore, you get 15 volts, etc. Is this more efficient than just turning it down to, like, say, 12 volts? Or? So it depends. Uh, you're, you're asking a, a, a question with a very complicated response. Generally, yes. So generally, uh, there are different ways to vary voltage. Um, variable supplies do it in different ways. There are some ways that are horribly inefficient. Um, those ways would be like voltage dividing with a, a potentiometer um, that you adjust. And it gives you variable voltage out, but you lose a lot of power. Um, so that's like, so this is way more efficient than that. Um, other methods are, are more efficient than this. So, uh, but I would say almost all of them are more expensive or significantly less efficient. This is almost universally the best way to get a variable voltage applied to a load such as a motor. A, lo a mo load such as a motor um, is able to handle these, what, what we call switching power. So switching power is when we turn it on and off really fast, right? So when we do this PWM, pulse width modulation, um, some systems are going to be sensitive to that. Uh, other systems are not. Mechanical systems like a, a motor, electromechanical systems like a motor, are totally fine with that stuff because um, the, the frequency domain way of looking at the motor, uh, it filters out all of that high frequency stuff. Doesn't, it's not like it's going to be jittering around. It's just like that really high frequency stuff just doesn't affect it. Uh, it's like you have to move this like, moment of inertia around. Um, but, so the signal, the signal is fluctuating at you know, 20 kilohertz or megahertz. It's like doesn't even doesn't even see that. Um, it's not even part of the. It's that's filtered out completely in those uh, responses. So, so a motor is fine with that. And actually, there are certain uh, other systems where it re works really well too. Uh, an LED is a good example too. So you can you you need to um, when you apply voltage to an LED. You can't just apply it directly, otherwise it, an LED will essentially, once it starts to flow current through it, doesn't have a lot of resistance, um, which is good in a sense, but it's also bad if you apply like your, load direct, or your, your source directly to it, because then you essentially short your load, or sh short your source. So you, you don't want to short your source by applying, putting the LED in there. So sometimes people just put a resistor in, not great um, putting a resistor in. Uh, you flow a lot of power just to power an LED, which is really efficient, but once you start putting a resistor in series with it, it's not efficient at all. So instead, you can do PWM where you short your system, you short it, but just like 
really, really uh, 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 for short periods of time, short bursts. And um, it's on for a fraction, like a, a, a very small fraction. But the LED, uh, or, but, but our, uh, visually, we can't tell the difference. We can't pick up on, you know, a, a refresh rate of an uh, of an LED that's in you know uh, ten kilohertz, stuff higher than that. Even I mean, we can see refresh rates on really old CRT monitors and stuff like that sometimes. And some lights you can see it, um, but most of the time uh, you do the PWM at well higher than our ability to see the refresh. So it just looks like it's on continuously. And you can change the, and you can change the, um, essentially the the dimness by dividing it down. So you variable, variable, pulsing. So pretty cool. So it works for also for LEDs. PWM. We're typically going to be thinking of it mostly for motors, though. Cause that's a great way to control motors. So that's PWM. Um, we'll talk more about the circuit that this is connected to. So this digital signal doesn't have any power behind it, right? This thing coming from the MyRio is, we have, uh, is we actually, you know, this is a good, uh, a good thing to, to think about. We have analog outputs from our MyRio that vary. We can vary them. I mean, we don't have an infinite number of levels, but we, we can vary them essentially continuously. But we don't have any power behind those either. We don't have any power behind any of our outputs. They're just uh, uh, signals that can be used to drive power. Okay, So we have a separate power source that connects to this motor driver circuit. That's separate from the MyRio. And that circuit, which we'll talk more about next time, it is using this signal from the MyRio, not for its power, but just for its waveform. And it's essentially opening and closing a gate for the uh, actual power source, like the, the, the power that we connect to the wall that goes directly to that circuit. Um, it like opens the gates, closes the gates, opens the gates, closes the gates. According to this PWM signal, um, but it's opening and closing the gates for the big power signal um, from your power source. So we have a power supply that's underneath our, so it's, uh, you know, those are the two levels of our apparatus. The metal box that's underneath the MyRio, that's our power supply, DC power supply. It connects to the wall, that's powering the motor actually. Um, this signal is not going to power the motor, it's just going to tell the motor driver circuit when to unleash the power from the power supply and when to not unleash it. So it flips on and off with our PWM signal and our, uh, uh, our logic digital I.O. Um, through channel zero doesn't have to actually do anything besides say, Turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, just at different rates. Okay, so we typically will do this at pretty high uh, uh, rates. Like the period of this signal, even when we vary, it doesn't change the period of the signal. We vary the width. Uh, the period might uh, is I forget the frequencies. Uh, I think it's 10k. It might be might be a lot higher than that. There are different levels we can do. I think we're doing it at 10k. I will, I will give you guys a better number next time. 10k, possibly. Um, but the higher the better. Uh, the higher the better because the effects of switching will occur at higher and higher frequencies, and therefore they'll be filtered better and better. So we won't see any effects from from it. So the higher you do your PWM frequency, the better, but doing it higher requires typically more expensive equipment, so 
you can't always do it at the highest rate, the, the rates that you want to do it at. But usually it's pretty good. Even cheap uh, Arduinos can do pretty high PWM rates. Okay, uh, encoder and counter. We don't need to do very high for our system because it filters stuff out really well. So it's really hard to make our motor jitter. Um, okay, encoder and counter. An optical encoder is mounted on the shaft of the DC motor. The encounter, uh, the encoder is this brand, and this is a, a link in the digital version of this to a, uh, a manual, the spec sheet and manual for this encoder. So it talks about the details of the encoder. And I might get uh, a chance to go into more detail next time, but I'll introduce it uh, today. So it sends 2,000 state changes per revolution. Therefore, each encoder state uh, change corresponds to a motor rotation of one two thousandths of a revolution called a basic displacement increment. So a quick overview of how an encoder works is you have the shaft, and you have a wheel around it that's got all of these. Um, so there are different ways of setting it up, but, but typically um, the disk is made of a clear plastic material and we paint uh, black lines on it radially so they'll be spaced evenly um, and there will be many many lines on it there are uh, 500 lines, I believe, on ours. Um, 500 lines drawn. So like, not by hand, right? Um, uh, very precisely drawn here. So if you have, um, what we typically have are two sources um, that are, so it's, it's hard to draw this without getting into the details, but, um, Say we've got a, a black stripe, we'll exaggerate its thickness here. Um, and we're going to put a, uh, we're going to put two uh, sources, okay, light sources, um, that are, nearby uh, that are behind it, say, shining through to us. So behind it, shining LED light to us. And when we have detectors on our side, that are detecting if the light's shining through or not. So when it shines through, uh, that means we know that it's going through the, the clear part. And when it blinks out, we know that it's going through a black stripe, right? What we do is we have two of them, uh, two detectors that are uh, uh, 90 degrees out of phase. So to draw that, we would have, um, so that would be, yes, yeah, so it's like about like there. So 90 degrees out of phase, meaning that if you were to look at the, the signal, say this thing is rotating around like this, it's one of them is going to turn bright and then so like this one is going to turn bright so if it's going that way this one turns bright first and then this one turns bright and then this one turns dark and then this one turns dark and then this one turns bright and then this one turns bright right so that's that's what happens and, and if we know that they're 90 degrees out of phase and we know that these stripes are the same width as the space in between the stripes then we know that uh, every time the state changes, meaning if the state is bright, so if the state is uh, uh, the level of these, so bright or dark, so light or dark, 
for um, each of these, then you can either, you can have four states, right? You can have light, light, dark, light, light, dark, or dark, dark, right? So those are the four possibilities. So when that changes, so when it goes from dark, dark to light, dark, uh, you know, and you know which one went from which one went from dark, dark to, to light, mm-hmm. which one went from dark to light, you know which one's leading, mm-hmm. right? Um, so if, say, this is A and this is B, if A leads B, you know that it's going this way. If B leads A, you know that it's going that way. You also get four times the resolution of just doing one detector because um, you have four states for every cycle here. So we have 500 lines and we have 2,000 increments because there are four state changes that you can have per line, which is pretty cool. Um, There's a lot of terminology in this encoder world and this is very inconsistent between companies. It's really frustrating. So I'm not gonna get into the terminology that much, uh, but I am gonna say that our basic displacement increment you can always convert however they talk about it into this, um, which is to say that there are uh, uh, one two thousandths of a, res- of a revolution for our encoder. Um, there, might, there are other encoders that have 250 lines that would have one over uh, 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 500, uh, uh, no, one over... Um, uh, one, one thousand, one over one thousandth of a revolution as their uh, basic displacement increment. So that means that you know uh, two pi over two thousand times three hundred sixty is how many degrees uh, we have as our resolution, right? It's pretty cool. Pretty, I mean, it's pretty precise. We know. Very precisely when this thing's moving. Doesn't that seem like overkill? Like, isn't that almost... For speed, it is. So if we're only looking for speed, totally overkill, right? Like, if this thing is going super fast, we're going to go through so many state changes. It's insane, right? But if we care about displacement, if we care about position, then um, three... 60 divided by 2,000, um, 0.18 degrees. I mean, it's, that's like, that's good. You don't see encoders go a whole lot higher than that, typically. I mean, you can get them, but they're just way more expensive. So, if you care about position, then this is like, this is probably good. Um, but if you know, if you were, if you only had uh, like 125 lines, um, um, then you'd be almost at a degree per line. Um, so yeah, it, it's there's this point at which like it's it, it can be too. It, I mean, you don't need it all, uh, and especially for speed. So for speed, you can get away with a lot fewer lines. Um, Because for speed, your number of state changes is very significant when you're rotating around that fast. So, yeah. Um, But if you want to have precise positioning, typically, this is is a pretty common, uh, what they would call, servo motor encoder. So, the terminology is wacky, but servo motors can mean in control applications. Servo motors typically mean motors that are higher end and allow you to do pretty precise feedback control on them, especially with position. Um, for, so for servo motors, pretty typical. If you're going to have any sort of precise servo motor on the more expensive side, so the motor comes with the encoder. They're usually together like 500 bucks. Like for the, like the motors that we got, that's approximate price tag for that. Um, so like they're, they're pretty expensive. Um, but 
for some applications, you need something that's pretty precise. For other ones, you can get away with a cheaper motor, cheaper encoder, uh, and you're fine. Another thing, when the, I've, I've noticed this happens a lot, is when you get into higher end stuff, they're just gonna, like, they don't have a bunch of different higher end things. Like, if you want something that's reliable, um, they also make that with the most precise encoders, and like they don't really have a lot of other options a lot of times. It's like, oh, well, if you're going to get the nice one that's reliable, then you have to pay for all the features. It's like if you want a nav in your Subaru Outback, and you, you just want the nav, but you also have to pay for the moon roof, and you have to pay <laughs> for the leather seats, and yeah. Not that I'm better. Um, so, an encoder counter in the FPGA interface determines the total number of these state changes. So, um, we are getting access to that. So remember, we have the system on a chip that's got this FPGA interface, which is super fast. Uh, and it allows us to count all of these state changes uh, at, a, at an extremely high rate. And we're going to be able to interface with that through a really simple function that lets us just ask, like, what's the count? What's the count? Um, so that's pretty sweet. So our system on a chip is really helping us out here. Uh, it gives us access to the encoder counter. And, and this is because they know when they build these system on a chips that one of the main things people want to do is keep track of encoder counts. So they have uh, uh, these interfaces sort of pre-built for us. Victor's just walking by with pizza. What's that about, Victor? OK. Um, the speed is determined by computing the number of state changes from the encoder during a certain time interval called the basic time interval, or BTI. And we're going to set that by number of weights that we do between times that we sample uh, what the, the encoder position is, okay? Um, therefore, the number of state changes occurring during each interval represents the angular speed of rotation in units of BDI per BTI. So the rest of this, so now that we've gotten through, like, what is PWM, how are we kind of using it, what is an encoder, how are we kind of using it? Um, now we're just talking about how to use this system to make this stuff happen. So I'm going to try to move a little quicker through this because we, you know, we, we don't have an infinite amount of time. So I'm going to try to move a little quicker. Uh, it's easy to talk about this stuff forever, though, because there's so much in it. So um, counting of the encoder state changes is accomplished by the FPGA uh, from the system on a chip. Uh, the counter must be initialized before it can be used. Initialization includes identifying the encoder connection, setting the count value to zero, configuring the counter for a quadrature encoder, which is what we have, uh, and clearing any error conditions. So a quadrature encoder is one that has these two detectors, like A and B, that allows us to determine the direction of rotation and the position. That's what most encoders are nowadays, are quadrature encoders. Um, the function encoder C initialize, included in the ME477 library, alters the appropriate control registers to initialize the encoder interface on connector C of the MyRio. The prototype for the initialization function is this. So you hand it the MyRio session and then the uh, encoder channel pointer. And that's, that's really uh, all you need to do. And it does the initialization for you. The first argument identifies the FPGA session and must be declared as a global variable for the application. That is, above main, you would declare it like this. The second argument, channel, uh, points to a structure that maintains the current status and, camp, and count value and must also be declared as a global variable. Um, we'll use encoder 0, so we would use the syntax my real encoder encounter 0 above the main function. Reading the counter. 
The position of the encoder in BDI may be found at any time by reading the counter value, which is sweet, right? So like it's keeping track for us, and then we just have to have to ask it whenever we feel like it. We're just like, hey, what's the what's the encoder counter? <laughs> and and it just tells us. <laughs> um, uh, the prototype of a library function provided for that purpose is encoder counter, and then you just tell it the channel, and it returns to you what the count is. Don't worry, it, there's plenty to do. That's done for us, but there's plenty else to do, so we'll, we'll get to that. So pre-lab preparation. Write a main program that produces a periodic waveform on not run that applies an average voltage to the motor determined by the duty cycle. The period and uh, one BTI um, uh, will be controlled by calling n weight functions each of which takes the same deterministic amount of time. During the first m weights each period, voltage will be applied to the motor. See the first graph in figure B4. So remember, we're doing this PWM, and we're going to have our, our clock is going to go through uh, uh, one, two, three, pass by m, and go all the way up to n. Okay, uh, and we're going to want our low state, which is our not run, to be zero, which is to say we want to be running, right? <laughs> run uh, uh, from zero to M, and then we want to have a state transition to high state, which is a turn off, so not run should be one, uh, uh, for... Uh, the rest of that BTI. And then we want to go back to the low state again. So that's what we, we aim to have happen in this, pro, in this here program. I don't know. It gets to the end of the day and you just never know what you're going to get. So, uh, good. So it can only go... Oh yeah, so we got to deal with that, right? Yeah. So what happens, so we're going to get to that, but Dane's already recognized an issue that we have. Because we're going to fill up our, really fast, we're going to fill up our buffer, right? Uh, we're going to fill up our, our uh, counter, which can only count up to, it's uh, an integer, and so we have uh, 2 to the 32 possible integers we can represent, and then it overflows, right? So what do we do when that happens? And this is where so-called modulo arithmetic comes in. So, have you guys heard of the mod function, or ever used the mod function before? No, I yeah, so it's the same, same. Uh, almost, we're going to use something very similar to the mod function from MATLAB. Same concept, where we, we essentially say, um, we're going to divide by this number and take the remainder, uh, and that's what our mod function is. So, but we're going to use a, a specific type, because we have to shift it. So we'll talk about that. So in addition, um, so in addition to having this uh, turning the motor on and off, um, uh, while channel seven of connector A is zero, the program will print the measured speed on the display at the beginning of each BTI. You will control channel seven through a push button switch. So on the little uh, uh, prototyping board that's connected to my Rio, um, there will be buttons, just small little buttons, that we will press, and we're going we're gonna to have those connected to digital DIOs as well, and we're going to, if we press the button, um, it's going to go low, and we're going to want to print the speed to the screen. So 
what you want is to, it's a, this is like, this is like, you don't want to annoy somebody with it being on the screen all the time, but if they want to know what the speed is, they press the button to have it print. And so every time through the loop, you want to print it when they're pressing the button. So there's another input, right? Is the button being pressed? If the button's being pressed, then print. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're adding a little bit of, this is a little English to it, right? This is a little curveball. So uh, the corresponding run waveform is shown in the second graph of figure B4. So what we'll want to have happen is very similar to the previous one, the one right above it. But during this first increment, of the of the uh, uh, run being zero, we want we're going to call this the speed state, which is to say it's just like low state, but so it functions just like low state, except for we're also going to be printing a value of the speed to the LCD during that one, and when that one is uh, ends pretty quickly, um, we don't want to do this on every increment of low state though, because then we would be updating the speed so fast. Um, we want to slow that down and only have that happen um, once every BTI. So, um, very good. So this one will have a different state function, but only activated when the, past, the button is pressed. That's right. So it's only so it's activated. So if you're holding the button, then it'll just keep it'll keep refreshing every time it goes through that that um, uh, a BTI. So every BTI it'll refresh as long as you're pressing the button. When you release the button, then it'll stop. We could do a flip switch too, where if you switched it on, it would display it, and we switched it off, it would stop displaying it. But we went with the button. Could do a light, a light sensor, and then like if you shine a light on it, it shows the speed. We could get really fancy. Um, okay. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Good. The algorithm should be implemented as a finite state machine, just like we discussed in in the lecture five or lecture 4.1, uh, as shown in figure B5. Um, so we have the state transition diagram shown here. And our, our four primary states are shown here. We also have uh, uh, an exit state as well. Um, low, high, speed, and stop. And then exit is what stop sends us to. So it's pretty, uh, uh, you know, for all of the different inputs we have or whatever, it's not that bad looking at this. Like, okay, if you're in high, you're checking a few things. You're checking what the clock is, you're checking what channel six is reading, and you're checking what channel seven is reading. And if this condition is met, you go from high to low, and you do these things. If this condition's met, and uh, uh, then you go from high to stop, and you change run to not run to zero. Um, uh, you, if you go from high to speed, um, uh, you do that if this condition is met. You set um, clock to zero and not run to zero. So these are like looking at your uh, transition diagram is, you know, not too bad. The transition diagram, I think, is visually like the first time you look at a finite state machine, it's the least intimidating to look at. When you get into the details, I find uh, uh, the table to be the best, but that, you know, that's why we have multiple representations. Um, Okay, so, so as shown, 
has five possible states, um, high, low, speed, stop, and then exit. Um, the inputs uh, will be the clock variable uh, and channels six and seven. So channels six and seven are connected to, to two buttons. So um, one of those buttons is going to be used for exit. The other button is going to be used for uh, uh, the speed button. So two buttons and um, um, also checking the clock as well. Uh, the outputs uh, will be not run, clock, which sometimes need to be reset to zero, uh, and the motor speed pretended uh, to the LCD display. So that's what we're, so we're controlling the motor and we're controlling the clock. Sometimes we got to reset the clock and we're printing the motor speed at LCD display, depending on what the state is. Uh, the corresponding state transition table listing all possible transitions is shown in this appendix B431, which is this table here. So, Table B3, if, uh, uh, before we get into this, I'm using an X here to denote an irrelevant input that we're not, we're not even worried about. And I'm using the O um, to say that there's no change in this output. So when the state is, and then here are the states, and, and the input is, and then here are the possible inputs, then there's a state transition um, that happens, and this new state is given in the right, and the uh, outputs are. Uh, um, and and is just the number that we are going to take. So, and actually, the user is going to supply those. So we're going to ask the user at the very beginning mm -hmm. for the number of weights uh, to use for the, the BTI. Uh, and then the number of those that we want the, um, the voltage to be on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the number of those, it's so like, what do we, so we're setting essentially what the um, duty cycle uh, is by setting M and N. Um, so M always has to be less than N. And preferably your uh, program, I don't remember if I have this in there or not to make sure that you can handle if so the user types in an M greater than N, um, but it really shouldn't, shouldn't be okay. I don't know what would happen if you didn't take it into account explicitly, but I think it would probably just go to 100% duty cycle. That's probably what it would do, depending on the logic, the way you set it up. But in theory, M should be less than N. So you're going to ask them for N, then you're going to ask them for N, or you could ask them for the other way around. OK. So overall, the main program will use MyRio open to open the MyRio session as usual, set up all interface conditions, and initialize the final state, uh, uh, the finite state machine using initialize SM described below. So this is so far exactly like we would expect um, based on the lecture 4.1 that we did. Then request from the user uh, the number n of weight intervals on, uh, in each BTI. And then request m, the number of intervals the motor signal is on in each BTI. And then start the main state transition loop. So then start going through. Got your state machine defined now, and you're, you're just going through your loop. Um, when the main state transition loop detects that the current state is exit, then it should close the MyRio session as usual. So that's when you're, you're done. So we do have a way to get out of this loop, unlike the previous one. We press the stop button, and then we're done. <laughs> I'd recommend implementing the stop button early on in your development. <laughs> it's just a thought. Um, it's nice to be able to end it, with, um, what do they say, gracefully. To end it gracefully. Um, the, the motor and it's <laughs> 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 running out of time. Yeah. <laughs>
So the only input the from the user is going to be N and M, correct? That's correct. And then, and then they can ask for the speed by hitting the button. So once, so the inputs from the user, M and N, are really initializing something because once the finite state machine has started its loop, um, those aren't accessible anymore. So then, then the user can hit the button to see what the speed is or it can stop. The user so can stop. So N and M are like their constant. Yeah, so they, they set them at the beginning. The double end that the take. Yeah. So for, so for this pr problem, we can only change the speed once, right? Uh, so set the speed once. Like set the speed. So your program is going to ask them essentially to set the speed once. And then just run it until 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 uh, you're done with that. You can look at the speed as it speeds up. So like when you start, probably the speed will be zero, right? Um, you're going to run the program, and this thing is going to speed up to it. So you could watch that by pressing this the button. But, it but then it levels out, and then it won't move much. Would it be that difficult to add some dynamic ability to change speed? No. Well, we're, I mean, we're going to do that. I mean, that's like that's what we're we're building towards. It's like this is the minimal th minimal example that that t uses all the parts that we need to do more. I guess. But you're right. We totally we've got all of it. So right there, ready to go. I mean, if you want to play with doing it, go for it. Um, but yeah, when you turn it in, dumb it down for me. Though. <laughs> Right. Maybe it's like a conveyor belt, okay. and you're like, I have three speeds, <laughs> one, two, and three. They're not calibrated at all, um, and it, all inside it is like, which position is the switch in? <laughs> is it in one? Put it at this duty cycle. <laughs> and it's going, is it in two? Put it at this one. <laughs> Did they hit the stop button? Okay, stop. Which... I mean, honestly, a lot of systems can be done, can be done that way. Um, but if you want to be able to have a user, say, type in a speed of, like, maybe linear feet per second or something that the conveyor belt be on, yeah, then you'd have to have a, a more involved program than this. Um, and we'll, we'll work our way there. And that's what we're going to get to the point where the user can just enter the speed they want in RPM, and it will hopefully control this, the motor to go that speed. And then um, uh, we could, for instance, add a disturbance to it. Like you could like slow down the, the flywheel a little bit by like safely putting uh, uh, some pressure on the flywheel not getting your hair wrapped around the axle or anything, hopefully. Um, and uh, even if we did that and we let go, our, our program should recover to the speed that we want it to go to. So, yeah, there, there's that, yeah. Yeah, uh, for the speed, in here, we put the number M and N, it just regulates the, the, the percentage of voltage that we will send to the motor. So it's basically limit the speed already. Yeah, so it's, we, we're kind of specifying the speed. Like, we're pretty much telling it like a fraction of the top speed yeah. um, that we want to go, right? Yeah. If we say that M and N are equal, then we're saying go as fast as you can. Uh, if we're saying, go uh, 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 just, you know, one, M is one, and like, go as little as you can, as, as, as slowly as you can. Um, and that's all dependent on what our, our uh, weight function, how long our weight function takes, right? So the ratio doesn't really matter that much to a point. Um, if you had it, if you had it to, uh, so that it was that you had like five seconds of on followed by 10 seconds of off, you would notice, right? Like, like that PWM signal is very slow. Um, and so 
you would notice it would kick on and then slow down, and kick on and then slow down. So as long as your frequency is high enough, as long as your, your weight function doesn't take too long, and you don't specify your M to be 5 million and your N to be 6 million, um, then you're probably going to be OK. Uh, so like if you're like N is 10 and M is 5, like that's good. And then does depend on the weight function, like is it is 2 seconds, 10? So, uh, I, I'm not telling you what the weight function is because you guys have to calculate it. <laughs> <laughs> they say that's for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> so, functions. In addition to main, several functions will be required as described below. They include one for each state, high for the state high, low, the function low for the state low, uh, the function speed for the state speed, and stop for stop. So just like the finite state machine code that we saw, uh, example we saw in the lecture, we will be doing a function for each state that we have. Um, double in. To execute uh, the user I.O., you may use the routine double in developed in Lab Exercise 1, or you may simply call it from the ME477 library. So my general recommendation is just to use the one from the library, just, in case, just so that we don't encounter a bug that is in double in and didn't crop up before. <laughs> uh, it's at least when you're developing. I mean, I, I, at the end, if you include your double in, great. Um, but at least while you're debugging your, your new program, I would use the library function. Just because we have that luxury. You don't always have that luxury, but when you have it, it's nice to use it. Um, so that's the same double in we've all come to know and love. Initialize SM, perform the following. Initialize channel 0, 6, and 7 on connector A according to figure B3. For example, for channel 7, it would look like this. So you, you're given a snippet that does it for one channel and I think you guys could do it for the other channels, not too, not too bad. Seven would be a zero. Six, or for channel six, it would be like 60 DIR? Uh, yes, so this would be a six, and this would be a six, and this would be a six, and this would be a six. Channel zero is this zero. This is six, zero. six. Zero, 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 zero DIR. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for this case, like, this channel is different from the channel that you use in this keypad. Uh, yes. So, in fact, um, this is all on connector A. So the MyRio looks like this, and it's got um, connector C over here with its pins, um, and then it's got connectors A and B over here, and they're identical. Uh, they have the same pinouts, except they're one's A and one's B. Mm -hmm. So I think this one's A, this one's B, I can't remember for sure, if you're looking from the top. Um, and so the B connector has the LCD and keypad connected to it. Yeah. So this is the LCD, this is the keypad. Um, and the A connector is the one that's got the, the electronics that interface with the uh, motor and the encoder and the buttons will be on there too. I was going to have you guys put the buttons on, but I'll, I'll come in. I'm probably not going to be able to get it done until Friday, but I'll come in on Friday and I'll put the buttons on. So, so that everybody starts with the same playing field, and the guys don't have to worry about like the buttons are in the wrong spot and you're off by one pin. So I'll put the buttons on. I haven't put them on yet. I apologize. This, this lab was a lot more on the hardware. I, I, there was more on the hardware than I had anticipated, and I got a little behind on it, so. Going to catch up, though. Um, okay. I know you guys don't have, have that feeling ever of being behind, and, like, it's hard to catch up. <laughs> I have that feeling right now. Maybe I just needed more caffeine. <laughs> Um. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, 
So, ast a so in the initialize function still. Then initialize the encoder interface, which I described above. Then stop the motor, which is to say set not run to one. Um, and then set the initial state to low. So that's what the initialize does. Sort of like in the example we did before, we set the state to A, we set the out to zero, etc. Like sort of like get everything initialized, ready to go. Uh, and then also set the clock to zero. State a, state a high function is going to have this logic in it. If clock is n, set it to zero and set not run to zero. If channel seven is zero, change the state to speed. If channel six is zero, change the state to stop. Otherwise, change the state to low. So that's the logic we'll use there. For the low function, um, we don't have a lot to do to, to look for our state transition. Um, all we have to do is to see if the clock is M, then set not run to one and change the state to high, which is to say um, change the, the state, transition the state over to the high state, which is to say when the motor is, is not running. Um, uh, speed is the function that is for the speed state. So in the speed state, all we really do is, is call this function vel, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, the function vel reads the encoder counter and computes the speed in units BDI per BTI. See vel below. Convert the speed to units of revolutions per minute. Print the speed as follows. So print FLCD and then um, print the speed in RPM. So you have to compute it first and then you print it with this. Uh, vel, write a function to measure the velocity. Each time the subroutine is called, it should perform the following function. Suppose that this is uh, the start of the nth BTI. Return the current encoder count. So this is little n, right? Not big n. So the current encoder count. So C sub n. So it's going to be interpreted as a 32-bit signed binary number int. And as Dane had already pointed out, there's a limit to that. It counts up to a point. If it's going in the same direction for too long, though, we're going to overflow that that int. Well, but granted, it is like 36 minutes, so I don't know if we're going to be running the motor. Is it 36 now. minutes? Yeah, Did you calculate it? Yeah, uh, it was like 2,100 yeah. something seconds. But what if we're... Uh, uh, it's going to depend on the That's speed, a though. RPM, yeah. At 1,000 RPM? OK. So you've got a little wiggle room. This is just a little wiggle room. But yeah, but you got to, I mean, you got to, this is the type of thing that bugs will creep into stuff through overflowing like an int. Like, this is like classic bug sort of thing, where like, it works just fine, and then like, suddenly it doesn't work anymore. Um, there is uh, this weirdest thing. In HP, you know, I really, you know, it, well, it's not called Agilent or whatever, but like an HP uh, function generator that I've used, a really nice one, um, modern one. Uh, you can set it to any any arbitrary waveform, and it'll repeat it. Forever. I mean, function generators is like that's literally what they do. Is they just repeat the same thing forever. So once you set the waveform, it'll do it forever. So uh, in that mode of arbitrary waveform, downloaded the arbitrary waveform that I wanted, and it repeats it. Fine. For like, I forget, hundreds of millions of times. Like just wonderfully. And and so in, in real time, it was, I don't remember how, how long it was, but like hours running away, just fine. And then suddenly it changes. Suddenly the waveform changes. At a predictable time, 
Like, I, and like, I don't even remember how we caught this bug. It took forever to figure out what was going on. Because our experiments were like, we had them all automated. And like, we're like going along and like, what the hell is going on? Like, we'd go look at the thing and like, it's doing something different now. Like, it wasn't doing that when we started. We restart the same program, run it again, and it's working fine. And then like, after a certain amount of time, it changes. And finally we figured out it's just as some weird esoteric bug, but it's probably a, an overflow encounter. That's what it is. But I don't know if they just never tested it out that far with the arbitrary one or what, but it's somehow, yeah, it's, uh, it's, this is the, the type of bug that that would be like, you wouldn't see it when you're just like testing small tests, but if you ran it for a long time, then it would have an error would, that would be hard to run down. So it's good to have that built in. Compute the speed as the difference between the current and previous counts. So, um, uh, so that's the, the, the first step. And then replace the previous count with the current count uh, for use in the next BTI. So you got a count last time you asked for it, and you need to keep track of that count for next time. That's going to be our CN minus 1. Um, and then uh, return the speed double to the call function. Note, the first time bell is called, it should set the value of the previous count to the current count. Okay, so you have to initialize that, but then after the initialize, it'll be fine. And so you can do that with, when you declare it, you can set an initial value, which is really nice in C that you can do that. Um, whereas, in a lot of languages, you have to put an if statement in there just to handle that initialization. The, the declaration thing in C is really handy for that. You don't have to do that specific if statement. If this is the first time it's called, then set this to zero. Uh, instead, it, it does that automatically. Pretty nice. Uh, good. Stop. The final state of the program. Stop the motor. That is set run to one, clear the LCD display, and print the message stopping. Uh, set the current state to exit. The while loop in main should terminate if the current state is exit. Save the response to a MATLAB file. See the lab uh, 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 procedure of appendix B44, which is the, the MATLAB, C to MATLAB uh, description. Wait uh, uh, is the last one here. So your program will determine the time by executing a calibrated delay interval function. Consider this, this wait function. So this is the same one we saw last time. Uh, notice that the above program does nothing but waste time. The compiler generates the following operation codes for this function. I mean, this is like half given to you because you didn't have to look up what the opcodes were for this, so the instructions are given. You have to look up the instructions to find out how many cycles they take. So you have to do half, half of the work. So the first column contains the addresses, and the second contains the corresponding opcodes. So they're all printed out there. The clock frequency of our microprocessor is 667 megahertz. Note carefully how the branch instructions are used. Determine the exact number of clock cycles for the code to execute, accounting for all instructions. For that, calculate the delay interval in milliseconds. So first find out how many cycles each instruction is going to take, and then find out in real time, because your microprocessor is, is going at 667 megahertz, how many seconds that is. Um, when free running, the speed of the motor is approximately 1,500 RPM. I, uh, this number is not necessarily a good number for us. Probably it's incorrect. I will update this for you guys. Um, likely wrong. <laughs> Uh, considering all the above, determine a reasonable value for n, the number of delay intervals in a BTI. 
What inaccuracies or programming difficulties are there in using a delay routine for control and time measurement? So I want you guys to think about this. Like your timing around the loop is primarily controlled by this weight, but you do a couple other things when you're in that in that loop, right? So how are those affecting things? So that I want you guys to think about that a little bit as you work on this, and I think it will become clear to you how to answer those questions. Header files, just given to you. Um, the usual ones, but we're adding in the encoder uh, and MATLAB files that we haven't seen before. Uh, the encoder one, obviously has to do with the encoder. MATLAB files is to do with saving to MATLAB. Talk about that. Modulo arithmetic will estimate the rotational speed by computing the difference between the current encount encoder count and the previous count. The counter is capable of counting up and down depending on the direction of rotation. Interpreting the count as 32-bit signed binary, the value is in the range negative 2 to the 31 to positive 2 to the 31 minus 1. For example, starting from 0 and rotating in the clockwise direction, the count will increase until it reaches 2 to the 31 minus 1, then roll over to negative 2 to the, uh, the 31. 2 to the 31 minus 1. I think I was saying 32. It was 31. Uh, and, continuing, uh, and continue increasing. How will this rollover affect our estimate of the velocity? Is the um, question that we're using this modulo arithmetic to answer. Um, assume that the current and previous counts, cn and cn minus 1, are assigned to signed integer variables of width equal to that of the counter. For our C compiler, the int data type is 32 bits, or 4 bytes. Further, assume that the angular position of the encoder changes less than 2 to the 32 over 2,000 revolutions. So about 2 million revolutions, probably reasonable assumption during a single BTI. <laughs> okay, um, Astronomical number of revolutions to go in some reasonable BTI. That is that the difference between those is less than 2 to the 32. Less than 2 to the 32. So if we make that assumption, which is a damn good assumption, <laughs> I like those odds. Um, uh, when we compute the difference, I didn't, yeah. Uh, when we compute the difference between two sign integer data types, the result is defined by the offset modulo function. So it's, it's the mod function, but it's a little bit of a variant of it because we have this offset um, that goes instead of, because we have this negative and positive thing, so we have to do this offset. So instead of the usual uh, floor of m minus d over n, we have to do this offset, but it's essentially the same thing where we're, but we're shifting. Um, where m is the value, n is the modulus, d is the offset, and floor x is the floor function of x, um, i.e. the greatest integer less than or equal to x. The result is modulo n, and always is in the range from d to d plus n minus 1. Then, for our case of int data, we estimate the relative displacement using modulo 2 to the 32 with offset d being 2 to the 31, negative 2 to the 31. Um, so this gives us our increment um, displacement. Let's examine what happens when we cross the rollover point. Suppose the previous counter value cn minus 1, was 2 to the 31 minus 1. And that during the BTI, the encoder has moved forward by plus 4. Okay, so the, you know, the speed of what's happening out in the real world, the, the counter could have gone 
any number of times during our BTI. So it went plus 4. Such that the current reading, Cn, is negative 2 to the 31 plus 2. So clearly, we have a rollover situation, right? The numerical difference is negative two bil or four billion, right? Yeah. However, applying um, uh, it's kind of odd. I don't know. My my references are off today. Um, uh, uh, applying this equation, <laughs> b two, uh, the thirty two bit signed integer arithmetic gives the correct result. So if we plug in the raw value, the raw difference between those two numbers, and then we do our mod on it, it gives us plus 4. So what we want is we don't want to overrun it um, and not recognize that that's happened. So we use this mod function, this this uh, shifted mod function to help us. And it's essentially given to you here uh, in, in B2. Um, but I think it's worth going through and playing with it, and like, like was done in this last paragraph, just sort of playing with it and seeing what it does when you plug in this number or that number. So the procedure is to examine the circuit on the breadboard of con on connector A, the MyRio. Um, the push button uh, switches a figure B6, connect channels 6 and 7 to ground when pressed. So these channels have pull-up resistors, which means that they're normally high, and when you connect them to ground, they get pulled low. Okay. So when you press the button, they go low. So you're waiting that, that change of state, the state transition happens when it goes from high to low. Um, and uh, use the oscilloscope to view the waveform produced by your program. For example, use n equals 5 and m equals 3. That would be a good place to start. Um, and you can, you can uh, connect this up to the oscilloscopes in the lab and look at what the waveform looks like. I um, will probably do the connection for you so you guys don't have to worry about finding the right connectors and all that stuff. I'll probably connect them up so that you guys have them ready to go. Uh, use the oscilloscope to view the start-stop waveform produced by your program and to measure the actual length of a BTI. Is it what you expected? And if not, why not? So what's cool about looking at it on the oscilloscope is that you can actually measure in time, right? So measure it and see what it is. I mean, you, you predict it based on your calculation. And it should be close, but um, if there's any difference, then try to, try to explain that. Um, if it's wildly different, something's wrong, <laughs> either in your calculation or in your measurement. It shouldn't be wildly different. Repeat the previous step while printing the speed, which should say press the switch. What does the oscilloscope show uh, has happened to the length of the BTI? What's going on? So something that we, we weren't anticipating is happening. So describe how you made this measurement and discuss any limitations in accuracy. In a later lab, we will find ways of overcoming this limitation. Recording a step response. So after you have your code running, as described above, try this. Record the velocity step response of the DC motor. Save it to a file and plot it to Mat in MATLAB. So here's how. Add code to your speed function to save the measured speed at successive locations in a global buffer. You will need to keep track of a buffer pointer in a separate memory location. Increment the buffer pointer each time a value is put in the buffer. The program must stop putting values in the buffer when it is full. For example, you could define these variable, or, or um, this is the, the global replacement variable for IMAX, um, define buffers, a buffer and a buffer pointer, and then in speed, 
um, use if BP is less than buffer max, then increment the buffer and write to the buffer. Or I should say, write to the buffer, then increment the buffer. Postfix. Uh, to record an accurate velocity, temporarily comment out the printf LCD statement in speed and hold down the channel 7 switch while you start the program. So there's a little bit of a hint um, for what happens when you are pressing the speed button. Um, maybe that causes some trouble. <laughs> okay, saving the response. The program should have the response stored in the buffer to a matlab.mat file on the MyRio under the real-time Linux operating system during the stop state. C resource C5 for more details. I was going to go through that today, but we've run out of time, so I won't go through that resource. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It explains how to use the built-in, with the function that comes in the ME477 library to write to a a dot mat file. Um, the matlab file must be called lab four dot mat in the file. Save the speed buffer, the values in n and m, and a character string containing your name. So, like your name, like Akara. Um, the name string will allow you to verify that the file was uh, filled by your program. So. Uh, if somebody else used that one, <laughs> then it's going to have their name in it. So it should write it with your name in it so you know that that was yours. Um, the array can be plotted using the plot command in MATLAB. Uh, from your plot, estimate the time constant of the system. <coughs> Plotting points instead of a continuous line uh, will make interpretation easier. What is the steady state velocity in RPM? So, some things you should be able to determine from your, from your plot. Extra. So, if you're feeling, if you're feeling like there's not enough uh, and you're bored over spring break, um, fixing the m equals 1 case. You may, have no, you may have noticed that when m equals 1, the finite state machine does not function as desired. So, this extra thing would be to explore what is wrong, how would modifying the state transition diagram correct the problem, how would you modify the state transition table, Modify your program to correct m equals one case and test the result. So there's a little extra extra exercise um, if you're bored. I think that's it. So yes, I know not much to it. Um, <laughs> 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 so yeah, I know there's a lot, and I I uh, will try to help you guys along um, as usual. But uh, I think. You guys are definitely getting your sea legs in this too. Like you guys are solving as many issues as I am, or more by far. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you guys are ready for this. I I think it's it's within striking distance from where you are now to get to this next level. So we have a couple weeks to do it. Um, I I think that I think we'll be a, just fine doing it. Um, and I'll try to spend a little extra time in the lab uh, helping you guys, especially with the hardware aspects, um, over the next couple of weeks. So, all right. Yeah. Any questions? This has been a forever lecture. I hope this saves. Probably the best point I've heard all day. Yeah. <laughs>